those who are able, please stand and join us in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, welcome to the council and staff. Uh, so here. We will keep Mr. Williams in our prayers tonight as he can't be here. Um, we will say an extra prayer for him. We thank you, Byron, uh, for the invitation. Uh, Madam Clerk, we have any public comments? So, Council, we have a large agenda, as you see, before us, so we're going to try to work through it expeditiously, and then I'll have some uh, some requests of the, of the public once we have public hearings so that we can accommodate everyone that wants to be there. Um, but first, on item five tonight, approval of our agenda. Before I uh, seek a motion to do that, we need to add um, to the decisions on public hearings on item, and item 9D, an application by criteria development for their rezoning. We need to... Um, this rezone has to be assigned within 60 days of annexation, and the planning board will discuss this matter tonight, and then come back to council tonight for our decision. Because of that window of time that's short, we will uh, ask, ask you to add the decision on public hearing on item 9D. Okay. And other than that modification, I would seek uh, approval of tonight's agenda as amended. Mr. Mayor? Yes, sir. Move to approve the agenda as amended. Thank you, Mr. Gaffney. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Mr. Buckley. Any discussion on the agenda? All right. All in favor of approving tonight's agenda as amended, let us say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay. Thank you. So let's go to item six, our consent agenda. We have three items on the consent agenda. That's six motion to approve those as well. So moved. Thank you, Mr. Gaffney. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Ms. Salmon. Any discussion? All in favor then of approving tonight's consent agenda vote to say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay, thank you. All right, no special agenda tonight. We have plenty of public hearings to get to, so we're going to start those now. And we'll go to item 8A, which is a consideration of the text amendment to the Unified Development Ordinance. And these public hearings will be held jointly with the planning board. So that item 8 is consideration of the text amendment to the Unified Development Ordinance. And uh, Mr. Downey, I believe, is here. Let me open the public hearing now first. Yes, sir. The public hearing is now open. If you will introduce the topic, we'll get started. Absolutely. Thank you, Mayor. Good evening, uh, members of the board. Um, as Mayor indicated, this is the first of several public hearings. This particular item is uh, to be clear is for a text amendment, a change to our zoning uh, UDO, uh, as it relates, as the mayor indicated. Uh, this is a consideration to change Article 4 of our Unified Development Ordinance uh, to specifically address the issue of religious complexes, commonly known uh, as churches, uh, that would essentially remove the consideration of being considered to remove the prohibition that currently exists for churches within the Central Business District, which affects both downtown Jonesboro as well as downtown Sanford. For a little more context, uh, recently, staff was directed by City Council to prepare an amendment uh, for your consideration for this specific issue. Uh, currently, uh, the UDO does not allow uh, churches within the Central Business District. Uh, and about 20 years ago, in April of 1999, City Council considered the same issue uh, to adopt uh, zoning changes. What they did at that time, based on research that I found at the council, um, was looking for a way to promote uh, churches to be located in other parts of the city, not necessarily to um, prohibit, to, to allow, to basically look at a compromise to make it easier, because apparently back then they had some pretty heavy restrictions all across the city in the late 90s. So what they did with that amendment is essentially they loosened those regulations in other zoning districts to help promote churches to be located out of the downtown area and into other parts of the city. At the same time, uh, while doing that, the city council back then recognized the existing churches that were in place and essentially allowed them to stay being grandfathered in. Essentially, staff was directed from that time forward to kind of keep an inventory of churches in both downtown Jonesboro and downtown Sanford and understand that any new ones would still be prohibited and would not be allowed. Complicating this issue, however, after council adopted or went through the, that process in the late 90s, um, there was what is known, commonly known as the LUPA, but it's the Religious Land Use and Institutionalized Persons Act of 2000. 
essentially, um, you've got in your packet there pretty lengthy blog uh, information about Rolugula, and I'll try to uh, go through some of that with you. Uh, essentially, uh, religious uses have land use impacts just as their secular counterparts. Large places of worship uh, creates the same noise, traffic, congestion issues as do other places of assembly of comparable size. The fact that a community center, a men's space, school, daycare, homeless shelter, or food pantry <coughs> is sponsored by a religious rather than a secular organization makes no difference in terms of land use impacts. So a basic proposition that religious land uses should be subject to the same land use regulations as their uh, comparable secular counterparts makes sense in the non-controversy right? And this is a question that David Owens posed back in 2010 when he was doing this summary. Now in response to that, Mr. Owens wrote uh, with the Institute of Government is not entirely. There are two difficulties with applying the basic propositions without qualification. First, persons have a constitutional right to the free exercise of their religious beliefs. Second, fear and uh, distrust, particularly of, of minority religions, has led to discrimination that on occasion is reflected in government land use regulations. In addition to basic constitutional protection, Congress enacted the RELUPA uh, Act of 20, 2000 to address this issue. It established the general rule that a zoning uh, or land making regulation cannot impose a substantial burden on religious exercise including religious assembly, unless it is in furtherance of a compelling government interest and the least restrictive means of furthering that interest. The courts have found that most general land use regulations do not substantial, or have found that most general land do not substantial burden with exercise. The burden imposed must be more than inconvenience or something that increases the cost of the religious user. The burden must be so significant that it renders, renders the religious exercise effectively impractical. Courts have found uh, that it is not a substantial burden to require compliance with the typical zoning regulations, that these include local uh, requirements uh, to, to locate large places of assembly outside of residential areas, uh, prohibitions of non-commercial uh, non institutional uses in, in industrial or re redevelopment areas, limits on the size and height of buildings and signs, and provisions for uh, adequate parking and buffers, and maintain maintenance of harmony with existing nearby uh, uses and congruence with historic districts. The cost and time taken to apply and go through the approval process, such as a rezoning or a special use permit, likewise has not been held to be a substantial burden. Conversely, however, he goes on to note, where a city or county is shown to be using its land use regulations to deliberately frustrate <coughs> a religious land use without appropriate justification, the courts will step in. Multiple, demand, uh, excuse me, multiple denials have prompted judicial intervention, especially when modifications in the application have been made to address concerns raised in an initial review or when the, each application procedure uh, produces new and inconsistent justifications for denial. Denials that are unsupported by showing any legitimate land use impact, especially where the decision makers seem to be ignoring relevant factual information, have also been evaluated. It is important to remember that if the actual uh, religious discrimination or unequal treatment of religious religions is established, the action is illegal, even if there is not a substantial burden. When considering a zoning district use regulation, uh, Mr. Owens concludes, be sure that, you, that they have reasonable alternatives available for religious uh, ex expression. If you want to limit location of all religious uses in a redevelopment area or an industrial district, be sure there are ample places elsewhere in your jurisdiction that these uses can be undertaken. This was a key uh, decision in several, uh, in a recent course case that he cites here, which is actually included in your report, the example being of Nixon versus Coke. Documenting the availability of alternative sites was thoughtful consideration prior to making the decision uh, can diffuse a substantial burden issue. Later, I'll pause there. I would remind you there are three cases that are cited in your report. Um, two of those actually illustrated towns that were, that basically lost a Reluva challenge, and one is the Coates case that he cites that where they actually stood a, a legal challenge. I'll pause there if there's any questions. Thank you, Mr. Taylor. We appreciate the introduction and the time here. Uh, so we do have an open public hearing, and I'm sure there are a lot of people here not interested in this. So if you're here tonight to speak on behalf of this project, either for or against or indifferent, all we ask is that you state your name and your address and come forward. Welcome, sir. Thank you, Mayor. Bob Joyce, 2003, Bandy Point, Sanford. Uh, 
Uh, I'm here tonight speaking on behalf of uh, DSI board and uh, stakeholders. Uh, Downtown Sanford Inc. Uh, was chartered by city council in 1984 and our organization was given the responsibility for marketing, promotion, and advocacy for small businesses and landowners in downtown Sanford, specifically the Municipal Service District, which encompasses about 17 blocks, essentially from Depot Park to Kiwanis Children's Park at uh, Elks Club and Wicker Street, Cardinal Street. Within that 17 blocks is the smaller Central Business District it's nine blocks, and it basically is the railroad track, Corner Boulevard, uh, Cold Street to Gordon Street, parts of those nine blocks. So we're here this evening to speak on behalf of the stakeholders in this nine block area. First and foremost, let me say we are not opposed to churches or other places of assembly in the nine block Central Business District or the 17 block Municipal Service District. We simply want everyone in these special high density areas to be good neighbors of each other and to help our downtown grow and prosper. In the last decade, downtown Sanford revitalization took a giant leap forward with the investment that you all made in streetscape enhancement. Private interests have come in and purchased and renovated key buildings. You have made public parking improvements and lots of small businesses have made investments in our downtown. The result has been a near doubling of property values in the MSD from about $40 million in 2009 to about $73 million in 2020, four times the rate of inflation. As this public and private investment has soared, entrepreneurs have come into our community especially with the RISE program created by DSI, uh, the Sanford Area Growth Alliance, and the Community College, and they have filled our empty storefronts, and currently there is only one available retail space in the Central Business District. Visitor traffic has rebounded. Events and promotions planned and managed by DSI, plus the returning <coughs> patrons at our star attraction, the Temple Theater, have boosted retail sales back to pre-pandemic levels. Retail sales tax collections are up by almost double digits year over year. DSI continues to work with private investors and developers on some large major projects. Uh, we have a hotel project and a couple of residential projects that are working with us. Our board is very proud of this record of success, which is due to your support and to many, many years of careful planning and strategic investment. We certainly stand on the shoulders of a lot of others who have worked since 1984 to bring our downtown alive again. We feel this proposal, proposal to eliminate all rules was rushed. We urge you to give us time to research how we incorporate these places of assembly in the nine block area Give us time to meet with everyone, small businesses, restaurants, churches, residential property owners, and other meeting venues so that we can all coexist as good neighbors and everybody understands the rules. Our downtown is thriving and we want that to continue. So I would like to introduce Molly Stewart with Morningstar, Morningstar Law Group, who is looking at this issue for us and has some recommendations. Thank you and good evening, Mayor Van and Council members. As Mr. Joyce mentioned, I'm Molly Stewart, Morning Star Law Group, and I'm here tonight on behalf of Downtown Sanford Inc. I previously have, also. Do you have a proper address if you need it? Sure, 421 Fayetteville Street Drive. I, I previously was a staff attorney at the American Planning Association, working with planners nationwide <coughs> who are on the ground implementing federal laws, court decisions, and other holdings right along with their local ordinances. It's never easy. I'm here tonight with my colleague, Hank Case. He is a litigator experienced in protecting the rights of religious users against substantial burdens imposed under land use regulations. One major reason we're here tonight is to reassure city staff and decision makers that we have time, that there's no rush to act tonight, and
and that the city is protected by RLUIPA as it seeks to improve its regulations. This allows for engagement with our downtown stakeholders and time to research best practices. There are two key questions that we'd like to see considered um, before action is taken. And with time to consider next steps, what insights might we learn from our long time and our newer downtown stakeholders? What is important to our existing churches, to business owners, to property owners in the downtown area? Downtown Sanford Inc. has built connections with these stakeholders over many years of working with them shoulder to shoulder. We believe it's important to collect their feedback and to report this back to you. Second, RLUPA has been in place for more than 20 years now. By now, there's a wealth of information available on the best practices and the worst practices for municipalities. What are those? <coughs> we believe it's important to research the on-the-ground experiences of other cities that have taken many different and creative approaches to ensuring their religious uses are not unduly burdened. We'd like to find out what those have been and how they have worked over time. As I mentioned, we have time to listen to the neighbors, to learn from other cities. We understand there is concern for the consequences of being out of compliance with RLUPA. RLUPA contains a safe harbor provision that protects the city from liability. If the city addresses any policy or practice that is challenged, courts have applied that safe harbor provision even where a legal action has already been filed. And this is not the case here in Sanford. There's plenty of time to move forward thoughtfully on this question. We're not seeking to infringe on free speech, but only to complete our due diligence in order to take a confident next step on these questions. The proposed amendment before you tonight has not benefited from the research that's needed and therefore is not the right approach. BSI requests that the proposal before you tonight be denied this evening and not delivered to the planning board for review. By not advancing the proposal in its current form this evening, we can research those best practices in zoning for impactful uses within the central business district and canvas our downtown stakeholders for their input. With this information in hand, BSI, this council, the planning board, and city staff can craft the right responses for Sanford, building on the wisdom of the people of Sanford and the experience of many cities who have addressed the same question facing the central business district. Thank you. Appreciate your comments. Are there others that would like to speak on the project on this uh, ordinance amendment? Please come forward if you're here to speak. Yes, sir. Welcome. I want to thank the council, mayor, um, all of our elected officials for even hearing this issue on tonight. Mr. Cook, yes. your name and address, please. Uh, Jeffrey Cook, uh, 605 Garden Street, Sanford, North Carolina. I'm, I'm born and raised in Sanford, North Carolina. And just hearing the individuals before me, I know they have their responsibilities to talk and the rights to say things. Um, but I look at the best interests of this city from my own hometown perspective. And from being from this place, from Sanford, I was gone for a period of time. And when I came back in 89, it was dark in downtown. And things have been done since then. Businesses have opened up. Things have taken place, and which I believe it comes from um, a city that is built on the backbone of faith. I believe that the way that towns were built in the past and cities grew, that schools, Churches were the central focus, focal point. And from the church, then schools erected. And from the schools, and after being educated, businesses were put in place and kind of circled around. Well, right now, downtown is a central area. I think there is a need for churches in the area to stay in line with what's, I believe, my good Lord and Savior, who I stand in representation of as his ambassador, I believe that what he would have us to do. I believe that the church needs to have a place downtown. I believe that the central focal point of this city should be the church. I believe that if we get back to the church, then this horrendous crime rate and murder rate um, that goes on in this city could be um, reduced as well. But as for the churches downtown, I'm, 
Again, I was known for a period of time in school and in other parts of this country. And to even hear that something like this was um, on the books, if you will, I did hit my ears now. I really couldn't believe it made. I know most of you wasn't wrong said when it got put in place. I just couldn't believe we're negotiating church business and it's actually made it to a place where litigation has been put in place and we have to defend it. So right now, I'm, my hope and my prayer is this litigation gets taken off the books and it's opened up to the church in downtown. I believe we will see a greater success if the pulse of the, this city gets back to that which it was built upon, which I believe was faith. All right. Thank you, sir. Hello, everybody. My name is Daniel Owens, 1508 Jam Court, Sanford, North Carolina. It is such an honor to be here today. I know everybody on this panel here you guys have watched me grow up, and I've served Lee County and San Francisco in the penal district for 21 years. I had the opportunity to do the People Loving People Unity Launch. That was a, a church event, because that's we brought people together, black, white, short, tall, no matter what religion you come from, to come together as a unit together. And I understand that you say we're rushing this thing, but we're not rushing. 25 years is not rushing. 1997 is when this ordinance was put in place. On Thursday, I had the opportunity to go to Mr. Jay's office. And I sat and I talked with him because he understood when this ordinance came into place. And he said, Daniel, let me tell you something. He said, the church shall always have a place. That's what he told me. Because he was here when, 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 when downtown was evacuated because everything went out to River Birch. And it was the churches that came in and put storefronts up, started their ministry. After a while, when this ordinance came into place, they said, we're not going to be no more churches here no more. Now, I understand, I understand business. But, you know, there's a Bible text that says, do unto others as you would like them to do unto you. All we want is a chance. We want a place in the space. I had the opportunity to read the closed session meeting on May the 3rd, and I so the comments that were made kind of hurt my feelings a little bit, but it's fine. Because you know what? We come back together again. Because Sanford says it's well-centered. And that says when well, we put family and people first. Well, family and people has come together. It's called the church. And we're coming together as a unit to say we deserve a spot in downtown. God bless you. I am the other half of Mr. Jeffrey Cook here, and I am a native of Sanford, live at 605 West Garden Street. Uh, born and raised, left, served my country in the military. Said I wasn't coming back to Sanford unless with a visit, but then there are other plans that did take place. I took the time to go to Sanford and see men, and I read here downtown Sanford is a 501c3 nonprofit dedicated to the economic health and quality of life in downtown Sanford, North Carolina. Its mission is to manage the development of downtown Sanford as the primary economic, cultural, and social, meaning an informal social gathering, especially when organized by the members of a particular club. Yeah, I went to Google. <laughs> and our group or even church social. So it's center of the community to educate the community on the unique assets and historical significance of the downtown area and to promote and stimulate the improvement of these assets. And one thing that I looked here was the social part that on our Sanford NCNet states and that is to stimulate the improvement of these assets. The other thing is that Sanford, when we think of Sanford, we think of well-centered, such as uh, what was just stated. Well, being well-centered 
Um, what have we well centered on, for example? We're looking at downtown being the centerpiece where there are people from other states, from even the surrounding counties and cities that are even looking at Sanford because it really is the center of a lot of large um, uh, cities. We would want to, I would think, establish a setting to where one can come downtown and see what Sanford all, is all about, looking at what's given for everyone to take advantage of culturally, economically, and even socially. Now, as I was reading, I've been reading and reading, and there's one thing that I have a question, and that is if indeed there's an ordinance that says that there's no religious gatherings that can take place in downtown Sanford, that I do question why is it then that we have a the, the, the anointed ones coming, I believe on Thursday, that's going to be downtown at the Beaver Park. And if indeed that this ordinance is in place, then why was that permitted to go forth? Which makes me wonder why in the first place this ordinance was put in place. It obviously has not been forced. And so therefore, when we look at, um, when we look at the law, it states here that first amendment, we have the ability, the right to practice the free expression of religion. Now, I have not known of any altercations between um, businesses and places of faith. I see where there has been a cohabitation even. And so when I think of this, I see no reason for the church and neighboring businesses to be unable to coexist. So I say let the owners of those businesses do what they do but that the owner of the church do what he does. And so presenting a well-centered Sanford simply means to avail opportunities for residents and for visitors. So if indeed you cannot force the church out because of the law, then what really do you have to stand on other than something that is to frustrate the people of faith and religion. So what I would say is cohabitate. Let the businesses go. Thank you that downtown has changed. That's good. That's really good. But allow a plethora of availabilities for those who come so that they can see that truly there is an establishment of faith that they have an opportunity to go to in downtown Sanford and downtown Jonesboro. I believe that we can all coexist in love, but yet we still look at the law and what the law says. And I understand that not abiding by the law and reading a lot of different things that I have, there's even a potential lawsuit that could take place. And I believe this city is growing by leaps and bounds. But a lawsuit, Sanford, would be an ugly thing to see, especially for outsiders who are looking to come here in this beautiful city that I'm from and beautiful people that are even here represented tonight. So I do say, remove this ordinance and let justice stand. Make just decisions and you'll see this place prosper. Make injustice decisions and you're gonna have hell in your hands because of what's gonna be permitted to be here in Sanford. So be careful. Um, my name is Barbara Barbera. Um, I live at 337 Manning Drive and I established Sanford House of Prayer at 109 South Steel Street. And um, it's a place where people come and go to worship the Lord. Um, it's quiet. Sometimes on Saturday nights, every now and then, we, there is an event. Um, and we could definitely um, cohabitate together, the businesses and the churches. So I'm for the churches being within the city limits. And um, it's something that you would hope people could come to, a place you know, of hope to be before the Lord, to worship Him, to read His word. Um, and we want everybody of every every age group, every denomination, 
and someone would like, I think the door was open and people come up and they pray, read the word. Um, it was commonly for Catholic children and um, it was supposed to be before the Lord. There was also a lot of prayer houses coming in from all over the world. Um, the International House of Prayer from Kansas City and it's a day and night, it can be a day and night thing and we're not very loud and um, children, children, adults, teenagers can play um, guitar or a um, keyboard and just read the Lord and receive help and, and his peace and his joy and it's been such an amazing thing to be able to establish it here in Sanford. It's a wonderful thing for Sanford. And I think for businesses and, this, and the churches could go have to figure out if there being a problem. Thank you. I'm Thank sorry, you. my mom is 91 and she's in the car. <laughs> so like, I, 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 heard, I had to my head. So sorry. We appreciate you coming. So love Sanford. It's been an amazing place to be for the Lord. Thank you for everything. Thank you. Davenport, 128 Brookfield Circle, Sanford. Uh, 
as a resident and a pastor in Sanford. Uh, first, I want to say I love Sanford. I, I grew up in the Bass and Lakeview area, but I remember uh, us as a family uh, coming to Sanford shop. I remember Zayers. Anybody remember Zayers? <laughs> <clears throat> and uh, when I was younger, you know, the values of our area and um, where we live uh, currently today, I believe, have always been to live and to let live, um, to do unto others as you would have them do unto you, to place a higher priority on people than on things, to give deference to God and His church, and not to give in to worldly influences that would take the values that I just mentioned uh, away in the thought of being progressive. I believe that we can have hometown, also Christ-like values, and move forward at the same time. My wife and I moved here to plant a church, One Hope Church, in 2003 on Henley Road. Had a house built on the west side of Sanford, and we truly love it here. Um, I went through a number of years ago, Citizens Academy, which I think has a different name now, Sanford 101. Um, and I enjoyed going through all the aspects of what happens uh, in the city and governance and all of those type things. Um, it was very eye-opening and uh, made me appreciate Sanford even more. I have opened some city council meetings in the past with prayer. Um, I've enjoyed seeing all the improvements that have been mentioned to the downtown area and the sidewalks, uh, the downtown, the lighting, the incentives that have been given to bus businesses to be able to come into the area and, uh, and then the jobs that that is and has provided in our area, um, the improvements to the parks and the trails and all that that has happened and is still to come. Uh, looking forward to that. And so we find it exciting to be able to live in Sanford during this time. As a matter of fact, Sunday, two days ago, uh, our church had had church in Kiwanis Park. Uh, and uh, thank you for that. We had the opportunity to do that. So we love that type of forward movement, that type of advancement. Um, I want to say again, thank you, Mayor Mann, uh, for all that you've done. I know that uh, your time is short in being mayor, but thank you for all that you've done for our community. I really do appreciate that. Thank you to the city council for all that you've done for our community too. And I want you to let, let you know that we pray for you regularly and that all the things that you have to face and the tough decisions that you have. But I just want to say today, I'm here just to encourage you to keep your focus on helping our community to have those same values that I mentioned at the beginning that we've always had and that we don't turn away from those, but at the same time, work for the betterment of our community. I believe that that can and should coincide. They should be able to work together. The issue of not having churches from renting space in the downtown areas, but also then at the same time allowing other gathering spots is not fair, not really tolerant, not really progressive. I would say it's probably a little depressing. Bars and nightclubs always increase theft late at night. Accidents caused by alcohol and sometimes more violent types of crime happening. Those are gathering places that are and may be downtown. Churches may not be a money maker for downtown, but would increase the presence that you want downtown. Peace, goodwill, fellowship, and the very presence of God himself. Side note, if this ordinance gets rescinded, you probably won't see but maybe one or two churches come into this area in the next five to seven years anyway. Um, it's, not, it's not probably a common place that people will look, and if they grow past 50, they'll move. They'll, they'll have a financial base to be able to do that when they reach 75 or more, and so parking won't be an issue there because there won't be room for them to be there anymore. But they will be grateful and the goodwill afforded toward them will come back to you and to Sanford as a whole in many ways. There's some incredible stats from several years ago when churches went to the police chief in Fayetteville, North Carolina and asked what was the most crime ridden areas of the city? They then took a team of prayer warriors once the 
the police chief gave them those areas, and they would simply drive through or walk through those areas and pray over those areas. They would pray against the crime and the other things that were happening there. Over a short period of time, the crime rates dropped in many of those areas by 50% or more. What was the difference? There was no programs, there was no big money spent, just people walking and praying. So much so that this happened that the police department would began to call the leaders and the pastors of those churches to inform them of other areas where crime might increase so that they could pray over those areas because they saw the results of what happened. Talk about teamwork. Talk about working together. I believe that is possible. That type of teamwork between churches and government is what I want to see and what I'm offering you as a pastor in the community. And I believe there's other pastors that are here and other pastors that I know that would agree with that and want to be a part of those kind of things. Inviting God to be a part of what we want to do and allow him through his church to be a part of what is happening will save money and heartache in the long run. It will promote harmony and unity and God will do what we could never do with our best laid plans. Just like every local Chick-fil-A is closed every Sunday, but makes four times as much as the local McDonald's down the street every year. So what we would do well to remember is that when we honor God and his church, God blesses. And that's something you can't figure into law or any other form of thinking. But it just, it just is so. When you strike down this ordinance that is not fair, not really legal, you're simply saying we still believe in hometown values, but we're making progress to invite more economic success, more families to come enjoy a community that moves forward, all the while embracing the church that Jesus Christ is building here as well. So what I'm telling you is that this does not have to be an either-or proposition, it can be a both-and of forward movement. For our community and retaining of and a recognition of God in our midst, and he will bless us for it. So I ask you to do what just, I would say, common sense says that we should do. I'm asking you to do what legally should be done. I'm asking you to not discount what God can do when we honor him and his church. We can't separate God from his church. I'm asking you to vote to rescind this ordinance that would make God's church and people second class citizens. If I may, I would like to end with a short verse of scripture from Psalm 33. It says, blessed and prosperous is that nation who has God as their Lord. They will be the people he has chosen for his own. The Lord looks over us from where he rules in heaven, gazing into every heart from his lofty dwelling place. He observes all the peoples of the earth. The creator of our hearts considers and examines everything we do. Even if a king had the best equipped army, it would never be enough to save him. Even if the best warrior went to battle, he could not be saved simply by his strength alone. Human strength. And the weapons of man are false hopes for victory. They may seem mighty, but they will always disappoint. The eyes of the Lord are upon even the weakest worshipers who love him, even those who wait in hope and expectation for the strong, steady love of God. God will deliver them from death, even the certain death of famine with no one to help. The Lord alone is our radiant hope, and we trust in him with all of our hearts. His wraparound presence will strengthen us, as we trust, we rejoice with an uncontained joy flowing from the Lord. Yet let your love and steadfast kindness overshadow us continually, for we trust and we wait upon you. Thank you for your time tonight. Drive at 375 Sand Hill Road 
in Carthage, right outside the city limits, but I'm here representing Life Springs Church at 3215 Keller Andrews Road in Sanford, North Carolina. And I would like to also, like so many that has come before me, thank you. Uh, I want to give honor to you, Mayor Mann, and all of you, and I mean this literally, distinguished chairpersons of the city council. Thank you. This takes a lot of guts. It takes a lot of courage. It's clearly uh, not a unified thing, and it's one of those things you may lose friends no matter what you do. I get that. Or not friends. Hopefully you won't lose friends, but you'll, you'll disappoint. That's a better way to say it. My dad used to say you go in a meeting sometimes, and you already know you're going to make somebody disappointed where you go. So I, I don't envy your position. Uh, you probably have said at times, why did I even want this position? But thank you for stepping up, and thank you for having the courage to do this. And I want you to know our church is here. And I started to say our church, but I just think, I don't know if it's appropriate, but I think the church, and if we had known this more, we probably could have given you even more people here to encourage you. And if this is appropriate, by a round of applause with the church, give a hand clap to these guys for what they're doing. We have prayed. Our church has prayed for this day. We have walked the streets. We have organized at times every day of the week prayer walks through downtown Sanford where we prayed over our downtown. We prayed over this. We prayed over our homelessness. We prayed over our drug addiction. We prayed over our things. And not just prayed. You guys know I've been to your private meetings. You've invited me there to speak, um, representing some of the things we've done. We have now been approved. Uh, as a dream center and we um, have for seven years worked hard it's cost us money it's cost us time but we've seen fruit so many people have come and they now have houses and they have jobs and we've helped so many get um, we, we've rescued 14 ladies in the last year from human trafficking right here in the <laughs> some of the things we've seen we've had so many we've had, we've had seven get into mental illness hospitals that we've done we've done so many drug uh, rehabs we've had one become a manager of a fast food place here in town that came off the street now i have to be honest with you though and i hope this is not any way ungrateful we're so grateful but we've not been received always with welcome and arms there have been those that would really like for us to just leave it as it is and leave them alone and not be in downtown and not be in Jonesboro and not do the things that we've done but um, we understand that, you know, not everybody likes the same thing. I mean, you have Christians that like NC State and heathens that like UNC. We understand that. <laughs> careful. Oh, yeah, careful. I'm sorry. Take that out of Take that out of We understand that some like blue cards and some like red cards. We understand that. But um, honestly, this has felt a little more than just a preference. It has felt discriminatory. It is felt discriminatory to the church, and it's hard to look at it. And so I, and, a, and this is not a closed threat. Please do not take it that way, because if it was that way, we've already done something. That, but I just want to make sure I'm clear, because I've heard it alluded to several times. But I don't want to. I want to make sure full transparency. We have sought preliminary legal counsel, and it does appear to be discriminatory. And um, there are seem, and also law firms from Raleigh as well, who seem like they would be interested in representing. But that's not our heart. That's not who we are. That's not what we do. We want to work with the city. The last thing we want to do is hurt our city. Yeah. We love our city. We love our city. That's what we do. So that's the reason instead of hiring a lawyer, we walk the streets praying that you would get to the place that you'd say, you know what? Enough's enough. Let's remove this. And so I don't know what you're going to vote, but I just want to commend you and give honor where honor is due. Thank you, because this is no easy issue. Um, churches are in the people business. That's what we do. That's, that's who we are. That's what we do. If you would remove or subtract from society every hospital that was started in the name of Jesus Christ, every school, university that was started in the name of Jesus Christ, every orphanage that was started in the name of Jesus Christ, every human trafficking leaders, go check it out right now, that started in the name of Jesus Christ, every drug rehabilitation, every homeless shelter, if you remove them from society that were started by the church, and I don't mean an organization, I mean the people of God that started it with a Christian mindset, you would be surprised at how few things would be left in our society that are actually for people. We're in the people business. That's what we do. And so I would just, and I know we got others that want to speak, and when I get a pulpit, and I get excited. <laughs> 
I would just say, would you please, I would encourage you to never, ever, 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 ever make a law that hurts people. And when you, when you refuse to allow the church, when all the good that we've done in the nation, to minister in certain parts of our city, I don't see how in the world you could say that is for the people. I, I would like to see how that helps the people. And so I just commend you, and I too ask that you would remove this discriminatory ordinance against the church this evening as soon as possible. Thanks again. Tomlinson. I live on 605 West Garden Street, and my mother has actually spoken to a few of you guys on National Day of Prayer, and um, I love Sanford with all my heart. <laughs> There's been times where I could actually move, leave Sanford if I wanted to, but I have chosen to stay here because I love this city. Now, <laughs> I do want to see changes in this city, but if it isn't with God, then I don't want to see it. I'm sorry. <laughs> Um, <laughs> all right, so Psalms 2, verse 1 through 5, I'm in the ERV um, translation if anybody wants to hear it or can get this out. Why are the nations so angry? Why are the people making such foolish plans? If their kings and leaders join together to fight against the Lord and his chosen king. They say, let's rebel against them. Let's break free from them. But the one who rules in heaven laughs at them. The Lord makes fun of them. He speaks to them in anger and it fills them with fear. Now I have one question. Why has this even come to the council to even take churches out of downtown Sanford and just places in general? Um, the church I go to on Saturdays is on 109 Still Street and there has been strangers or people to come and wanting to get delivered or asking for help. And I do speak for the, the age group of my Christian people. I'm, I'm so sorry. Oh, I'm nervous, guys, I'm sorry. But um, I stand for Lord. I'm a strong believer of God. I'm 17 and I'm, the one I praised day to day and I fasted yesterday and I saw that scripture and I just felt like that was right for today oh, Lord, Lord, Lord. you want to take out the Christian and the churches but there's still demonic stores and places over there like hugger mugger and just a lot of witchcraft that's going over there you guys haven't spoken anything about that but you want to come to the churches. I think that's all I have to say. I hope and pray that you notice a young person standing up here today for the Lord. Thank you. So we appreciate everyone's comments. Uh, anyone else that would like to speak on behalf for or against this ordinance? For the sake of time, please come forward or we'll move on with our public hearing. Were there any questions or comments from council to staff? Yes. Sure. Uh, we'll start with the enterprises that are in the Central Business District, the ones uh, primarily downtown San Fernando, voluntarily pay 18% more in taxes than anybody else in the city of San Fernando. Okay. Uh, event centers, which would include churches, uh, occupy valuable parking spaces, which would disrupt local businesses without providing replacement purchases or other income. I, I believe that event centers, again, including churches, need to pay or arrange for parking so as not to interfere with the small businesses and their owners and employees who are just simply trying to make a living. There's no reason to 
to rush the decision this evening. We need to take time to uh, prepare an ordinance that yeah. takes into consideration a provision for sufficient accommodations for parking. I've heard the terms anti-church tonight, which it upsets me. Sanford is six miles across. I can go from First Calvary Baptist to First Presbyterian in under 10 minutes. First Baptist is almost next door, and St. Thomas is not very far away. First Baptist, St. Thomas, and First Presbyterian are as close to downtown as you can get without being inside one of the storefronts. St. Luke's and St. Stephen's over on my side of town are, are again within 10 minutes of those same churches. We're not anti-churches and I, I hate to see that being brought up. Uh, so if we would at least have a consideration for the downtown small businesses and take the time to ensure that there is sufficient parking and it's not interfering with those businesses, there's no problem. As was mentioned earlier, there's no rush. One, one of your speakers, I believe it was Mr. Davenport, mentioned that there probably won't be a church that's buying to be coming into downtown for the next five to seven years. That's very likely. The property values in downtown, as was also mentioned, have skyrocketed. It's not going to be much much different in building your own church than trying to rent a space downtown. So, no reason to worry about that part. So why do you worry? We also have had a comment made about the horrendous crime rates. Over the past 30 years, the crime rates have steadily dropped. So, thanks, thanks to our Sanford Police Department and our uh, County Sheriff. Let's, let's Take it calm, take it calmly, think it through, make sure that the ordinance written or changed takes care of everybody. Thank you. Are there other questions, comments for staff or council have any other um Mr. Mayor, just I'd like to take this issue for further investigation, further research, further collaboration with everyone. I'm a Christian person, and I believe in church, and I believe in God, and I love God. Um, but we need to get the church folks, the downtown Sanford folks, and every stakeholder in this room together and try to figure out the best way to go about handling this situation without breaking any laws, without breaking any rules, without getting sued, without making anybody mad. And if we work together and no one gets mad tonight, everything will be okay and we'll get there. We just need a little bit more time. And I think that my motion will be to table this issue before it goes to the planning board so that we can get together, discuss the issue, and make sure that everyone is on the same page. Everyone's not gonna be happy, but in the end, if you don't do your due diligence, and look at every single aspect of a decision that you make, you could end up biting in the rear. And I don't wanna be someone that sits up here and makes a decision that might bite me in the rear. When I go into the courtroom every day, I am the most prepared person in there. And I'm not gonna vote on this tonight or send it to the planning board without being prepared. And preparation is important. And I think that we all need to take a deep breath understand that we're all one people. We all love this town. <clears throat> and quite frankly, we just need a little bit more time to try and figure out how this is gonna go so that the downtown Sanford folks and everyone else can live together in harmony as we all want to do. So I would move to just table this issue and not send it to the planning board for further uh, investigation and um, due diligence. Mr. Post, thank you. Uh, we're still in open public hearing, so we can't take a motion until we close it. But you can hold that thought. Are there other council members that would like to speak or ask questions? Oh, just on how uh, questions you can go to quick statement there. Yes, sir. And that is that you must remember that the earth is the Lord's. Mm. Mm -hmm. ah. And the doing is thereof. And this is why John would say, in my father's house, Go back and think some 2,000 years ago, we can 
attest to uh, many sermons, many songs that you preach. There is no room in the air. And me, for one, as a city council, is to understand exactly what is for good and right for all parties. That my conviction is that I don't want to be a part of a tag of having that scripture or that theme of some 2,000 years ago we're saying no room in the air. And therefore, opportunity to use to have conversations, to discuss it more in detail. But I can tell you that from the point of where I'm at, from the conviction of where I stand, what I stand, and who I stand on as well, that there uh, cannot be no room in the air. We must move forward with some of the things we've heard from some uh, young lady who spoke on St. Thurs, also with Ryan, with uh, Valeria, Mr. and Mrs. Cook, uh, uh, Pastor Owen, Pastor Davenport, and also Pastor Charles. I want to thank them especially for coming up and standing uh, before the church and standing on, all along as a witness of the church. I really want to give uh, you know, appreciate you guys for, and also the ones who stood behind us that didn't say anything because you're not saying something, sometimes saying something that you stood with So I want to thank all of you. We're here tonight uh, for for the reasons that they spoke of on, uh, on tonight. But I just want to make my statement from the council member tonight, where I stand uh, as well on this issue. Uh, again, understanding uh, that we do need to have maybe some discussions as to how we go about go about going into the air. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Buckles. I think Mr. Taylor and then Ms. Allen. And I'll be able to make something that you would like, Mr. Taylor. Okay. Um, First, I just want to thank everybody who came here tonight. We're, we're in these seats because we passionately love this community with everything that we are. And to see you all out here caring so much about the people that live here and the future of our community, it means so much to us. Because a lot of times we deliberate a lot of things uh, to a lot of empty seats. So just the fact that you all are here. And I've had a chance to talk with so many of you about uh, this issue. And um, I think we have exciting opportunities to work together to, to address this. And to Councilman Buckle's point, you know, some communication and some dialogue is very, very important on these issues. We have had many issues that uh, people felt like they hadn't been heard, they hadn't had a proper amount of time to, to come together to, to reach a place where we can all cohabitate together on the things that are most important, our values. Um, that was brought up tonight, and I think a little bit more conversation can get us to a place where we could all be here together. We have um, a lot of effort that has, has been put in on everybody's part to be building our community, and this is the type of place where we'll be defining um, where we go forward. I think Councilman uh, Gaskin, um, you know, you brought up such the important part. No one here is looking to regulate the free expression of religion. Um, regulate speech, um, you know, many things come up, speech I like, speech I don't like, um, that's fine, that's what makes a textured, wonderful community, and the fact that we can all do that respectfully is important. Um, our job as a governing board is to make sure um, that we make decisions so that we can all do that together as good neighbors, and some of that comes to a place where we have zoning decisions, and we, we make certain um, places that are, are for different things, but that we can all figure out how, how to do that. I think we're, we're standing here tonight at a place where I'm not sure we have all the right answers, which is why I personally also agree that we need some space um, to work together to do that. And you all are here tonight because you care about that, so please be a part if we move forward on having those conversations and making your voice heard so that we can make sure that we get to a solution that works for everybody and that we keep the heart of our community intact and um, our people moving forward as well as as well as our vibrant uh, community that we brought forward. So thank you all for being here, most importantly of all, and making your voice heard because that's the kind of thing that is, is so valuable to me as a council. Thank, thank you, Rebecca. Okay. Yes, sir, thank you. Um, before I start, I want to kind of elaborate on how we got where we're at right now. Um, in our latest budget, uh, we actually added, in fact, uh, I had made that recommendation that we had that to pass, and it was voted on unanimously um, that we add a zoning enforcement position. And I informed town council member, director, 
of that position and immediately got a good response um, that there's an area in downtown Sanford that she wanted to start with in enforcement. And um, after that took place, I started looking at the zoning ordinances <coughs> that were in place and things that needed to be cleaned up before this individual would be able to go out and enforce what we have on the books uh, so far as the zoning infractions are concerned. Um, and then conversation took place in a joint planning commission meeting, uh, I think it was the main meeting. And uh, staff brought this to city council where we secured a six to zero vote to move forward to remove this ordinance. <coughs> Um, and Mr. Post was not a president at that meeting. It proceeded to go forward to the Joint Planning Commission, which is not a public hearing. <coughs> and I was told the night before that they were going to come and talk. Uh, we didn't allow, allow the conversation because the litigious nature of what we're dealing with is not. And I didn't want self incrimination. Uh, we received a five to two vote from the Joint Planning Commission, and it's now before us. Um, one of the beauties in, in service here is, is getting to work with the different personalities. And uh, I'm really grateful for the, the man that's not with us tonight because we had a conversation Saturday and he made a statement that the church towards the downtown Sanford before they take up for us and they're going to be here after us. And mm -hmm. I can't tell you what that meant to me, especially what happened. So I, I stand here tonight just to tell you that I know where his heart is, and I know where the hearts of these congregations are right now. But yet, it's falling on deaf ears. The legal municipalities have a position. They're not going. They're not going to spend us on that. They're an iron insurer. They're the ones that go to battle for us when we get sued. No position on this. They're not going to be there for us. So guess what? Mr. Post made a very good point to me after after our joint planning commission, he called me on the phone. And he said that you know, this rises to punitive damages level because we know what is wrong. And we're not doing what is wrong. Mm -hmm. To ignore this raises our it heightens our position even more. Um, so as we close this tonight, I want us to think about a couple of things. What is our position with our staff now to enforce this right now? What are we going to do if somebody applies tomorrow? They will get an answer that no, you can't do that. But he also may open up more lawsuits. Mm -hmm. It's one of the hardest things I've ever had to deal with on this council in 15 years. The other two was when I was targeted when we moved our meeting night from Wednesday afternoon to Wednesday night, and I made a commitment to 800 kids in Raleigh to be there every night on Wednesday night. And it was switched back to what was supposed to begin with, which is Tuesday night. The other time was when prayer was at 9 p.m. And this week, somebody sent me a, a message, and somebody that didn't even know what, or last week, was, didn't even know what I was going through. And they sent me a slide that said, stand for what is right, even if it means standing in line. And I can tell you one thing. There's so many things that have happened in downtown Sanford. There's been a gross overreach of downtown Sanford Incorporated. They have gone to businesses outside of the central business district and told them that they can't do what they're doing. Sanford, the Downtown Sanford Association is not an enforcement mechanism. We want to make that very clear. They're not to enforce our laws, our bylaws, or our statutes. Um, and I hope that as we go through this, and the mayor has been has came up with a great plan for growing Sanford, he's done a stellar job. But I hope that we would not become Sanford open, open for business, but closed for God. Amen.
Yeah, I'll, I'll let you in on the little secret. There's not any novices up here. We all know how this game is played. If you want to prevail, you show up with four boats. Well, sometimes Mother Nature and Father Time get involved, and Mr. Williams isn't here tonight. So I want you to keep in mind that in 30 days of the six council members here, only three of us will still be in both positions, and that's Mr. Buck and myself and Mr. Taylor. Uh, Ms. Wild will be sitting where the mayor is, and we don't know who will be in her place, and we don't know who the other two will be. So uh, you may, the mayor only gets to vote in a time, and you haven't had a single vote in almost eight years. You might get to see one tonight. <laughs> Sanford is there to advocate for downtown businesses and retail operations. It's a tough call. It's a hard decision. We have nine blocks in question. We have to figure out how we are fair to everyone, how we don't tie up downtown, and how we continue to grow downtown in a way that's fair to everybody. And if you think for one minute that my faith's any different than yours, then you're misjudging me. But if I thought that for a second there wasn't a place to worship in this city, that you can only do it in the nine blocks. I would have already passed an ordinance or gotten these council members to pass an ordinance to open up downtown to every church that could get there. But that's not the case. There is plenty of places to find to rent cheaper and probably better and more accommodating to people who want to come to your congregation. So we've got to, we're going to wait. I'd like to see us weigh it out and discuss it because not only churches, but event venues, uh, places where you know, wedding places, these things, we all we have to figure these out. Um, I don't really understand why the issue came up because we really didn't have an issue. We kind of created an issue that has come before us tonight that could you know, potentially gin people up to be pitted against one another. And that's not what we want to do. So I do appreciate the heart and feeling that's going on. But, you know, when you're a city councilman, you've got to listen to more than just one sector of our population. We have to work hard on it. Um, so I appreciate that. But I understand that... Um, with a show of force tonight doesn't necessarily push our hand. The planning board has to do what they do, and then it has to come back to us to do what's right for downtown, where we've made a $9 million investment. And there are a lot of people downtown that have their life savings in their businesses. And so we gotta be careful that we don't harm or injure them because suddenly there's neighbors downtown that tie up the entire city block for multiple hours. And these are the things that come to our mind. No one, I think, on this council or this staff is unchurched. Um, so hopefully we can come to a conclusion and make it. But the last thing I think that's fair to say is Sanford doesn't believe in God or Sanford doesn't uh, worship the Lord because I know that we do. And I know that I've had prayer breaks in standing room only. And I have sponsored those for six years straight. So let's have some decorum, let's have some civility, and let's let everyone do their job. And hopefully we can all walk away soon with something that makes us all proud. Because um, it's a tough call. We understand what you're saying. No one's against the poor, but we have a duty to do up here tonight. So hopefully we'll do our due diligence and come back with a good result. All right, so I'm going to, I don't think anyone else has a call or has made a motion. Yes, sir. I, I do have one, one more comment, especially with the impl implication that we are somehow anti-church or might be anti-church or voted vote against it, that a six nothing vote that we would receive doesn't mean we're going to pass something that we shouldn't to, to proceed cautiously and doing it properly. But the other thing is, is I can, I've tried, I've been searching my memory, I came up with one time when we've been involved with the situation with the church, and New Hope Church, when they purchased the former boat dealership, asked to be incorporated in the city limits. Uh, the effect that has is their utilities drop to one half, and we lose all potential uh, property tax from that property because churches don't pay property tax. That passed without any problems whatsoever. 
So the city lost money on property taxes, the city lost money on utilities as well. So I, it, all, it really bothers me when someone comes up with, with implications that were not, you know, that were anti-church or something. We understand the law. The reason we passed the uh, motion to proceed six to nothing was because we intended to look into this and to get it, cor get it corrected in, in doing so so that we don't hurt it. We hurt as few people as possible and hopefully no one. So thank you. Thank you, sir. All right, I do appreciate this. We have another public hearing, so this time we're gonna to move to close this public hearing. The public hearing is closed. Thank you again for being here and being down for the business tonight. Um, let's move on. I think we can try to get this next item in and take a break. Sorry, am I even too far? Yeah, we're good. Okay, so we do have a motion from the floor of the table. Uh, this public hearing the planning board, and then we have a second. Any discussion? Is there any discussion about the John, okay. you did so All in favor of the table tonight, public hearing, and uh, planning board recommendation, you're voting to say aye. Aye. Any opposed? No. Okay. We have a no. All right. Three no's. Okay. And, and that puts me in a position to break the tie. Mr. Harris, correct. And I would vote four table and four three. Same thing. Same All right, let's move on then to our next uh, item, which is, which is a motion to take from the table the public hearing on petition for non contiguous annexation by Stevens Enterprises. We'll pause and let the room clear, and then we'll pick up this public hearing. Rice Krispies going.
Annexation by Stevens Enterprise. This table, uh, this hearing was tabled at the June 21st meeting and be untabled or continued at tonight's meeting if no one has the will to do so. Is there a motion to take from the table? All right, is there a second? Thank you, Jim. So a motion to second. Any discussion on taking this from the table? All right, all in favor of taking from the table the public hearing of petition for non contiguous annexation by Stevens Enterprises vote to say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, well, this has been taken from the table. Um, Mr. Montgomery, let me open the public hearing and then I'll turn it back over to you, sir. Okay. Our public hearing is now open on the uh, public hearing on petition for non contiguous annexation by Stevens Enterprises LLC. Mr. Montgomery? Yes, Mayor, members of council, as you mentioned, uh, had this before you uh, last month. This is a non contiguous annexation for Stevens Enterprises LLC. Um, the property in question is behind you on a map uh, indicated in blue. Uh, this, this property is uh, west of the airport and the railroad track um, between US 1 and the railroad track there. Um, and uh, I think there was some. The public uh, had come before you and stated that they had received notification and you wanted to make sure that that was taken care of. Um, and that, that, that those discussions, uh, or those, those notices have been rectified. And uh, since that time, those folks um, have been identified and given property. Further questions or comments from council on this item? Yes, sir, Mr. Harrison. Major David Thomas here. I am not sure if Major Thomas, yeah, there he is. Uh, he's in the back. This is a rather large area. And aren't we short police officers now? That's what I'm saying. have enough staff to cover these massive areas. Well, <clears throat> what I was saying this area is bigger than this area. This area is wooded currently, and this area would, would take some type of sort of consideration for the development to take place. Um, depending on uh, the extent of this development, it would be very, very likely going to need robust water and sewer access, which would take considerable time to get there. There is um, sewer available on uh, across the railroad track. So uh, obviously that would have to be extended by the time around that. Uh, the developers are working on various plans and options, and so it really would depend on how quickly. Uh, but yes, uh, something that again to make the property this time and demand for service will be very limited. So the chief is not in favor. No, sir, not about that. Thank you. Any other questions, comments? If there are none, then there is a, uh, I would look for a motion to extend the corporate limits if that be your will. So moved. Thank you, Mr. Gaston. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Mr. Harris. Hey. No, I did not. Thank you. Wait, did you just miss the chance for the public to? Yes, no. No, I did not. Thank you. Um, I'm sorry, the public hearing is still open. Oh. <laughs> and if you'd like to come speak, please do. Thank you. Hi, my name is Cassandra Burns. I live at 967 Breezewood. Uh, last time I was under the impression the representative um, or the applicant was supposed to speak 
first and that right off the beginning of the time? Not necessarily. If you'd like to speak, you can. Okay, great. It's up to him if he wants to speak. Do you want me to speak or? But you may go ahead since you're here. Okay. Uh, first, I want to express my gratitude for being notified of the annexation hearing and for this opportunity to have a voice. Uh, there's a lot of concern about the notification process. Several of my immediate neighbors who share property boundaries with this parcel still haven't received any notification. And similar to last month, my notification did not arrive until three days ago. Uh, might I offer a solution of using registered mail for these notifications going forward? Even though it is not required, this could provide comfort and assurance to all parties involved and it would seem reasonable to defray the cost to the applicant. Um, I'm not placing blame on the notification process. I really do think this might be a mail issue, especially um, the timing, uh, probably being something that's new and different since the pandemic. Um, and that the notification process should probably adapt accordingly. <clears throat> but also to make a note that there, I do have several neighbors who share these property boundaries who have not received notification. Uh, the material provided about this annexation says Deep River Fire Department will provide emergency services uh, coverage to this area. While everyone in our community appreciates and values the department and its volunteers, they do have a great need for more funding. Their newest engine is over 25 years old and the annual debt payment required by the owner of this 600 plus acre tract to the Deep River Rural Fire Protection District is only $161.84. Unfortunately, that would not even cover the cost of a single call out, let alone the upgraded equipment needed to actually protect a development like this and the adjacent residents. I know there is potential of a new firehouse on US 1 and Cohen Road. Per an email from Councilman Gaskin, this new firehouse would supposedly cover this parcel. Per information I could find online, the impetus for this new firehouse is mostly about covering a new 1,000 home development nearby. 1,000 homes and 600 plus acres of industrial development seems like it's putting a lot of pressure on something that isn't even close to being built yet. Annexing this parcel today with no plan for any kind of funding for the Deep River Rural Fire Protection District and only a vague promise of better resources in the future would leave this parcel and all adjacent residents without sufficient protection. I know that the city of Stanford has received special dispensation for exceeding the state standard of only allowing up to the equivalent of 10% of existing city limit area to be annexed as satellite or non-contiguous land. The Stanford City Council has been utilizing this special permission um, almost exclusively for commercial and industrial interests and with a lot of negative impact on the adjacent residential areas, mostly in the form of decreased property values, increased traffic, and decreased access to natural spaces. What concerns me most is that the Sanford City Council has the authority to make these decisions, while the residents most affected aren't even allowed to vote for the members of this council or the mayor. Because of the continued problems with the notification process, a lack of sufficiently funded emergency services protection coverage, and a lack of representation for the residents most impacted, I would strongly urge you to deny this annexation request. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Please come forward if you'd like to speak on the project. My apologies for uh, trying to conclude. It was a misstep. We want to hear from everybody here tonight who'd like to speak. Well, good evening. My name is Audrey Gray. I live at 950 Breezewood Road. Um, my concern with annexing is that we have enough publicly or public response services to cover the area. Um, we've been given a vague promise of yes, this will be done. Um, in my research, I cannot see where the Colin Road Fire Department is stated to be started anytime soon. And so my concern is do the timelines of this project and future response services line up? What do we do in a situation where this project is built more quickly than the fire department? Um, I'm an adjoining property owner, so it is really important to me that there are sufficient response services. Um, that's all I have for you. Thank you. Appreciate your comments. Anyone else like to speak on this project? Good evening. Hey, Mr. Mayor. Um, Members of Council, uh, my name is Jason Policino with Road Drive Now, 2293 Code Harbor Trail in Greater North Carolina. Um, really, again, like the last meeting, I'll, let the, I'll reserve most of my comments when it comes to the zoning public hearing. I think that remains a most humane annexation, I think, in and of itself, uh, speaks for itself. If you have any questions relative to anything, I will be happy to answer them. 
Thank, Thank you, sir. Questions or comments? Yeah. Other people here tonight would like to speak on this project? Okay. Council, comments? Questions? I'll, I'll, I'll go ahead and have one. William Shrapnel here. How many, how many buildings are you expecting to put up when? That seems to be a concern that there's going to be a lot of buildings soon. Uh, it's a question as interesting as it's germane to annexation. Um, I'll answer that by saying I'm not currently under contract to design do any on-site detailed design for either a speculative or a build a suit uh, project. From there, I can't answer it, but I'm not under contract to start working. Thank you. If I may, Mr. Hegward, I think they posed a good question about fire calls. Can you maybe eliminate that a little bit? Oh, I guess so. Maybe I'll try to. Um, um, Mayor and Council, as a reminder, in this year's budget, there is adequate funding in place to go ahead and start the construction of the fire station that is referred to. Fire station will be at the intersection of Miller Road, US 1. Um, as you know, we already own the site. We're in the final stages of design, and that will be coming back to you here very shortly. We look forward to the design. And, I mean, the final design and actually. Uh, the bidding of the construction for that for that station. Obviously, it's going to take time for the construction um, to move forward the process. Um, again, our, our goal is to be in front of any major development at that site. Um, and what we've done, we are negotiating with the Deep River Fire Department at this time. Um, as you know, some of these areas where we've annexed prior to major development happening, we haven't been able to adequately um, work on a contractual relationship with the, um, with, the, with the fire department in that area to. Um, We'll continue to provide that service until our station is complete. Um, those negotiations are still ongoing. Um, and again, um, the city of San Francisco will respond. Again, there's no real development in that area, but um, obviously we want to provide protection for that area um, going forward. So we would respond, and we would respond in conjunction with the Deep River Fire Department to work with us on that before we respond together. So our goal is that safety is paramount um, during this time. And so again, we'll be coming back to you about Staffing that fire station um, going into later this year. Thank you, sir. The, the council we work very hard on with the fire department getting it into this budget. Any other comments or questions? Is there anybody in the audience that would like to speak that hasn't had a chance? Just really quick, can I? Have? Thank you, sir. Thank you. Good evening. Hi, good evening. This is uh, William Johnstone. I have an address on the Breezewood Road as well. Actually, to be honest, my current residence is 538 Old US 1 Moncure, which is right across the river. Um, but my family and I are building on the adjacent property. The question I had, I guess, is regarding, um, there doesn't seem to be a proposed, um, there, I'm more familiar with the next motion, but my, my question is, on what basis, I guess, would we approve this proposal if we don't know who the occupant is going to be. So in other words, we're proposing to annex this to be within the city limits. Can, maybe why why would you do that sight unseen if there is no construction plan? Is, is there like a, a motivation or a rationale for why you would want to take this now forestry I guess that might, what's the impetus for the council to vote in approval of that? Yes, sir, good question. Mr. Daly from our planning department might can speak to that for you. Good evening again, Mayor and Council. Um, yeah, so to try to answer your question a little bit, typically um, when a, a large property like this, they're interested in uh, development that would occur that would allow them to do either higher density residential, or in this case, they talked about industrial for this particular property. Typically they are they need access to public utilities that only the city can provide, the water and the sewer. So that's typically what drives this. In addition to that, um, they are working with our design team typically, and as Jason kind of alluded to, at some point they'll start coming to us with different design concepts and different projects, and it's a lot easier for the developer to have some comfort level of knowing uh, who they're working with and kind of making that process. So it's very common for an undeveloped track 
that is that knows at some point they want access to those utilities that they're going to annex early on, and then that and then they'll follow up with rezoning as indicated on your agenda tonight, and that'll kind of get their entitlements in place, and then that and then they'll start working with staff to, to form you know, to, to kind of get even more detail as to exactly what's going to occur from there. And I'll pause there. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Brown. Uh, questions or comments about that? So this is how that process typically works, Mr. Dowdy. An owner of a property has a right to sell or develop it. It comes before us to make that decision through a plan and board recommendation. And this is how all of our projects typically evolve. Yes, and, and, and as, they, as David usually indicates to you, they do give us and you some preliminary level of understanding what they intend. Right. Um, so you kind of get an idea from industrial, residential, et cetera. Right. In this case, they seem to be talking more industrial, correct? That is correct. Any other comments or questions? Public hearing still open. Okay. Uh, at this time, then I don't see any others. I will move to close the public hearing. The public hearing is now closed. Thank you. Now we can um, deliberate and consider an ordinance extend the corporate limits. If that be your will, would the former like to make the, the motion again? So moved. Thank you, Mr. Gaston. Is there a second? Thank you, Mr. Harris. Okay, open the floor for discussion by council. All in favor then of approving the ordinance to extend the corporate limits of the city of Sanford for Stevens Enterprises LLC vote to say aye. Aye. Any opposed? All right, thank you. Thank you for that. I'll leave a little bit of time. Would you like to take a break? Council, would you like to take a break or are you ready to go on with another public hearing? Okay, let's go then on. Uh, Item 8C is a rezoning request, uh, a motion to take from the table an application by Trinity Capital Advisors, LLC, to rezone 13 tracts of land on uh, 611 acres total with frontage on Rod Sullivan Road and Jefferson Davis Highway. Ms. Bill, let me um, open the public hearing and then I'll turn it back over to you. Our public hearing is now open. This public hearing was tabled on June 21st as well. Ms. Yes, sir. Yes, I'm sorry, I was just going to say that we were taking it from the table from June 1st, yes. Do we have a motion to take from the table? Second. All right. So Thanks. technically, I believe this never got to public hearing last month because the annexation wasn't approved. And if it's not in the corporate city limits, we can't proceed with the, I believe that may be a typo. Okay. I yeah. believe this is a new public hearing. Or the first time this has gone to public okay. hearing. So So, if that, do you want to amend anything? Uh, okay. It was an automatic decision. Are we going to assume that it was tabled correctly? Okay. All right. So there's a motion to take from the table from Ms. Allen. Thank you. <coughs> Second, Mr. Gaston. Thank you. All right. Any discussion on removing this from the table? All in favor of taking from the table the application by Trinity Capital Advisors, let us say no. Any opposed? Okay. All right, now our public hearing can go on. Yes, sir. Good evening, City Council, Planning Board, and staff. Trinity, Advis Trinity Capital Advisors, LLC, is requesting to rezone 13 tracts of land comprising 611.9 acres with frontage on Rod Sullivan Road and Jefferson Davis Highway, as illustrated on the screen behind you. From residential agricultural to light industrial to allow the property to be developed and marketed in an industrial manner. Therefore, the company has submitted this rezoning application for your consideration. This is a standard general use rezoning request as opposed to a conditional rezoning request. Therefore, no site plans or subdivision plans or building plans are required as part of this rezoning request. The information for this request is on pages 24 through 52 of the council agenda and pages 9 through 37 of the planning board packet. The existing zoning of residential agricultural is established to provide areas for low density single family uses, low density agricultural operations, as well as agribusiness and supportive industrial and commercial uses. The proposed zoning of light industrial is established to provide areas that contain a mix of light manufacturing uses, 
office park, and limited retail and service uses. The Plan San Lee Long Range Plan identifies two separate land use designations for this site. Most of the property is an industrial center, or I should say most of the property is designated industrial center, and the remainder of the property is designated as countryside. The staff report contains information regarding the zoning districts, the overlay districts, utilities, roadways, and the long range plan place type designation, which I would be glad to expand upon if requested. Regarding the staff recommendation, the majority of the subject property included in the rezoning request conforms with the recommendation of the long range plan designation of industrial center. Therefore, there may be a reasonable expectation that the property would be used in an industrial purpose. However, it's ultimately up to the city council to determine how the city should grow and if they're comfortable with the proposed development of the site in an industrial manner. Additional information presented at the public hearing should also be considered in the recommendation and final decision. This concludes my staff report. Are there any questions? Thank you, Ms. Neal. Um, appreciate the introduction again. Uh, questions, comments? Are there other people here tonight that would like to speak on the project? If I may, I received an email that I'd like to read to the board okay. uh, before anyone else approaches. Please do. My name is Jane, I'm sorry, my name is James Citronelli. I own the property at 900 Greasewood Road, Sanford. I'm writing to you today to express my disagreement with a proposed zoning change by Trinity Capital off of Sullivan Road, Rod Sullivan Road. Over the past 20 years, I owned the property. I was finally able to build my small retirement home and started working with the NC Department of Agriculture to develop the land for farming. I should be ready in the next few years to have the operation up and running. According to a recent Times article, the nation lost over 100,000 farms between 2011 and 2018. Changing the zoning from residential to light industrial just further erodes the county's agricultural heritage and conservation of rural livestock Lee County is well known for. Additionally, there are several small creeks and water basins that run through the proposed property. Commercializing this area will only hurt local wildlife and water supplies cause unnecessary runoffs and possible flooding to my neighbors and me. The proposed rezoning to light industrial will only further damage the area and is a direct conflict with the RA zoning, which states, RA zoning protects and serves, preserves valuable agricultural areas. LI allows for manufacturing to replace agricultural. Some of the approved businesses for light industrial areas include refractories, pharmaceutical manufacturing, smelting operations, metal manufacturing, etc. Many who use harsh chemicals in their processing. With over 30 years of manufacturing, I'm fully aware of the dangers with these operations. Additionally, light industrial will cause extreme light and noise pollution to the surrounding area. As stated earlier, there are several creeks in the area that flow into Deep River. I feel that developing this area will damage the natural watershed of the area and cause issues with our irrigation and increase the risk of flooding. The material provided about this rezoning and annexation says Deep River Fire Department would provide that coverage. And while everyone here appreciates the values of the department and its volunteers, they do have a great need for more funding. Their newest engine is 25 years old. The annual debt payment required by the owner of the 600-acre tract to the Deep River Rural Fire Department District is only $161.84. Unfortunately, that would not even cover a single call out to this tract let alone the upgraded equipment needed to actually protect a development like this and the adjacent residents. For these reasons, I would strongly urge you to deny the rezoning. The applicant has described how this development may be a benefit to the continued growth of Sanford and Lee County. However, they're not bound to anything they say for the general use rezoning. If you're not comfortable with this entire 600-acre tract being used as a quarry or chemical manufacturing facility, not to mention the total destruction of a fragile watershed area, then please deny this rezoning. Conditional rezoning is a much better tool for the situation, and what I'm strongly urging you to consider and use. If the applicant had applied for a conditional zoning district type two, as described in section three of the UDO, they would be required to provide a site plan and to show how the development is compatible with the surrounding neighborhoods. They would also give the city council the ability to work with the applicant on additional conditions that would be of the best benefit to everyone. As a concerned citizen whose biggest retirement dream and large investment 
or irrevocably be impacted by the future of this land and this community, I strongly urge you to use your legislative authority to deny this rezoning request. Finally, changing the area into the zoning in the area to light industrial will further stress the already limited water and sewer system. Traffic will also increase from 600 vehicles per day to well over 4,000 vehicles per day. The rural area is just not designed to safely handle that much traffic. Respectfully submitted, James Critinelli, 900 Greasewood Road, Sanford, North Carolina. Are there others here that would like to speak on this project that haven't yet? Please come forward. Yes, sir. Mayor, members, council, my name is Jason Burkson. I'm 2293, Soto, North Carolina. Apex, North Carolina. Um, I'll go with the customary applicant going first because I'm uh, this round. Um, appreciate your time this evening. Um, as it was stated, it is a uh, general use rezoning. Um, so there are limited things to discuss. I will discuss a little bit about the nature of the property itself and why we think it is appropriate for this particular use. Start first and foremost, the fact that the majority of this property was designated for industrial purposes in the land use plan adopted by both the city council and the county commissioners. Um, we are proposing a light industrial pro product, not a heavy industrial product, which limits many of those more obnoxious uses as neighbors would tend to see. Um, it would be similar to what you all experience at CCEP, which is running out of spaces and would allow the momentum that the city of Sanford has to continue. It has the most restrictive buffering as required by ordinance against the residential uses against it. That would be the minimum standard with which we would have to adhere to. Um, again, plans as we move forward may increase that. The minimum is the most restricted uh, as prescribed by the city ordinance. Uh, for the most part, and looking at the topography of the site, it falls inwards towards the two streams that you can see on the figure that's on the screen. Uh, they are in the green areas. Uh, those are large drainage ways. Uh, both uh, the green that you see is actually uh, FEMA designation, so they are very large drainage areas. Um, I'll speak to a little bit more about those uh, in a second. Um, Ultimately, this project will bring additional water and sewer to the area and will be more than likely available to residents uh, as this council may choose to allow. Um, also, this area is in the watershed protection district, so it will be one of the few areas in town that will be required to provide stormwater management. There will be stormwater management regardless of the development on the site. I've heard a lot of uh, discussion about debt payment to fire departments and things like that. I'm not a tax attorney. I'll be really careful in, in how I say that, but I would have to uh, imagine that increased development uh, adding to the property values on the site, as well as it no longer being the forestry program, would dramatically increase uh, any tax payments both to the, the city, the county, and the fire district. Um, finally, just speaking sort of to the, the nature of the development on the site, primary access, really the only road access at this point in time is Rod Sullivan Road. Uh, as I mentioned, there are two very significant stream features on the site, both of which are FEMA mapped. From a practical standpoint, those stream crossings are very, very expensive, uh, approaching seven figures. For those of you on the council that have uh, had to approve town drainage pro projects, you are uh, probably familiar with that. So the only logical way to develop is really from Rod Sullivan Road to the north with really needing all of those things to occur before you can afford to move all the way up to the furthest area north. So that really concludes my comments this evening. Happy to answer any questions, and I'm sure the neighbors all have good points to add as well. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions uh, for the developer? Other questions? Yes, sir. I would like to ask, uh, why would you not consider or is there an appetite not or appetite to consider a conditional zoning body here that will allow this, this governing body to have a little say? Yeah, it, it, it has been discussed. Um, obviously, it's a much more lengthy process. You can also create a situation, especially in, a, in an industrial sense, where if you create that detail, often of which
Michigan, many being many people are asking for, we would be back before this board to rezone if we needed to amend some of those details. So again, it, it's simply wanting to understand where we are, if the council is going to consider this um, as we have with the land use plans in this area and be allowed to move forward, it's certainly going to be bringing development plans, go to the DOT, the TRC, fire, police, all of those things will continue to be reviewed by the city as we move forward at whatever time. Uh, just not prepared to be able to have a detailed development plan at this point in time that we felt confident wouldn't have to be amended. Thank you. All right, anyone else like to speak on the uh, public hearing? Yes, sir. Uh, William Johnson, uh, the Mont Gear address, 538 Old Miss One, also on Breezewood Road. My, my wife and I are building over there. Um, Everything uh, that you just said is, is reasonable. I guess the only question is, if it's not in a conditional approval, then you don't necessarily have that authority and that ability to work with the developer who still hasn't put forth a plan as to who that resident, you know, or that tenant or that that commercial property owner will be. If all of the guidelines and the and the usage restrictions that you talk about. Um, those would all still be, you know, relevant with conditional approval, except for we could probably have a, a better opportunity to work with the council to make sure that local properties aren't negatively affected. We, we all have wells. Um, you know, there's significant concern that some, of, if you look through the light industrial application, a lot of it is, you know, office buildings. But there, there still is a, a decent amount of manufacturing that's uh, accounted for in there. I just would ask the council to consider that before giving kind of blind approval to potentially any future tenant without any kind of conditional approval, I, I would think that, you know, maybe working with the local population and kind of ushering this towards a conditional approval would give us a lot more comfort. That's what I would say. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Sir. Hello again, Ms. Hickerson, 967 Reeswood. Um, I've got a statement to read and some of it's going to sound familiar to the email from Mr. Catelli um, because I've been doing some organizing around this and, and uh, we've been sharing that information. So, a general use rezoning from residential agricultural to light industrial is not appropriate in this case. The applicant states that residential development is often not compatible with this area, but of course those of us who currently live in all of the surrounding properties would disagree. All of the land surrounding this collection of property, property is currently zoned residential and used for single family dwellings with the exception of the general use. This rezoning would be inconsistent with the long range land use plan, Plan Stanley, as some of the area is designated to be countryside. The long range land use plan and the unified development ordinance do little to identify how countryside should exist directly next to industrial center. A general use rezoning also does nothing to preserve any of the reasonable accommodations that existing residents would need to make such as buffer areas and downstream flooding considerations. The rezoning does not have to follow the currently existing property lines and it is not appropriate for all of the property owned by the applicant to be rezoned light industrial. A good example of this is the northwest portion of the Douglas Tract, which is actually physically separated by US-1. With a general rezoning to light industrial district, the following, among others, would all be allowed. Up to 80% impervious surface area, Brick, ceramic, glass, metal, and or cement factories, machinery and equipment manufacturing, freight terminals, railroad freight yards, sewage treatment and water treatment plants, concrete and asphalt plants, every kind of landfill, chemical, plastics, and rubber production manufacturing, sawmills, solid waste collection, mining and quarries, and storage of flammable liquids in bulk. A general rezoning allows any or all of these worst case, worst case scenarios. Even if the developer promises none of these things are a part of their plan, a general use rezoning holds absolutely no accountability and no repercussions if the developers change their mind. The applicant has described how the development may be a benefit to continued growth of Sanford and Lee County. However, they are not bound to anything they say with general use rezoning. If you are not comfortable with this entire 600 acre area being used as a quarry or chemical manufacturing facility, not to mention the destruction of a fragile watershed area, then please deny this rezoning request. Um, I also want to add um, that under general rezoning, the 80% impervious surface area, 
They did mention um, having stormwater management would have to be a part of this, but that doesn't mean they couldn't still go to 80% impervious surface area, which all the stormwater management in the world is not going to mitigate the impacts that would have on all the surrounding land. <clears throat> Conditional rezoning is a much better tool for the situation and what I'm strongly urging you to consider and use. If the applicant had applied for conditional rezoning district type 2 as described in the UDO, they would be required to provide a site plan and show how the development is compatible with the surrounding neighborhoods. This would also give the city council the ability to work with the applicant on additional conditions that could be of best benefit to everyone. When I first bought my property, I was told by multiple sources that the adjacent areas had high likelihood of remaining natural wooded spaces and the worst case scenario would be continued low density residential development. Obviously, that has 0% chance of being true any longer. I am not trying to stop this entire process. I have accepted that this area will be developed no matter what. The conditional rezoning seems designed for this exact scenario, allowing economic commercial growth, but with the city council making sure it is not at the cost of the total destruction of the land and with at least basic consideration for the needs of the people living in these adjacent neighborhoods. As a concerned citizen whose biggest dream and biggest investment will be irrevocably impacted by the future of this land and this community, I strongly urge you to use your legislative authority to deny this rezoning request. And the last point I want to make is that if the non-existent plan uh, is so fragile that moving to conditional rezoning and having to have additional meetings would destroy it in some way, then that's not a good plan to start with. Um, and again, uh, I would urge that uh, rejecting the general rezoning and moving to conditional rezoning um, <coughs> would, I feel, be a really excellent move and do a lot to assuage the fears of the adjacent landowners. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Before you come forward, there are the others that have not spoken yet that want to speak. I just want to be sure that, please, if you haven't spoken yet, let's come forward. Thank you. And there's a lady behind you, Mr. Randolph. I'm sorry, I'm right on. <laughs> I, I was like, well, yeah, then, then you're next, Mr. Brown. Thank you. Thank you, Nikki Kessinger, 119 Mill Run Lane in Sanford. Um, I'm not as prepared and have done my research as a lot of the other people have, um, but I do have some of the same concern. Um, I don't understand how the notices went out and who they would consider to be affected that should have received a notice. Um, I do live in um, Copper Ridge East, um, which is kind of in the middle of that bottom portion off of Farrell Road. And I know we didn't get a letter, and I know some of my neighbors didn't. I, so I'm just putting that out there in case we were supposed to, um, which is why I didn't know this was happening. Um, I guess as well, I mean, I appreciate the comments about the light industrial. Um, I do feel a little bit better about that than heavy, but you know, as was just said, I'm not gonna trust that something isn't gonna go in there just because someone said likely it won't. Um, I don't want chemicals going in the air. I don't want chemicals seeping into the ground. Um, frankly, anyone that's traveled US-1 north and past exit 84, I don't want that smell in my, you know, in my yard while I'm having a barbecue. Like there are pollutants that go in the air that do affect the quality of living. Um, and this as well is my retirement home. Um, we moved here four years ago, plan on, you know, dying in there. So um, I enjoy the wooded area around us. I enjoy, you know, the bunnies and everything else that come in our yard. And um, also just want to um, make sure of both the traffic and the roads because, you know, Farrell Road and Rod Sullivan Road, those are not sidewalks um, already. You know, when we go for walks or bike rides, walk our dogs, I mean, it's already a little bit dangerous <laughs> because of the traffic that's there and just adding all that additional traffic. Um, I don't know if, if anything's being considered with um, the road structure and sidewalks or anything like that because those would be necessary or we would not even be able to, you know, leave our little cul-de-sac um, safely. We wouldn't have any more safe to even exercise. Um, so. Um, sorry, I'm not as prepared as everybody else, but I just wanted to um, have my chance to speak and share some of my concerns. So thank you for the opportunity. Thank you, ma'am. We appreciate your comments. Mr. Randolph, would you like to come next? Okay. Good evening, Mr. 
Mr. Mayor, members of the council, members of the planning board. My name is Jimmy Randolph. I reside at 3405 Windmere Drive here in Sanford. Um, I currently serve as CEO of the Sanford Area Growth Alliance, and I'm here tonight to speak in support of the rezoning request. As you all know, the certified sites and shell building program at Central Carolina Enterprise Park, located just one exit south of the property under consideration tonight, have attracted more than $350 million in new capital investment and tax base expansion uh, for San Lee County since 2019. And with each new success at CCEP, the inventory of available sites and buildings for marketing in Sanford and Lee County is reduced. Um, in our strategic planning discussions with city and county staff and elected leaders, um, there's been strong consensus that we must identify appropriate additional sites for future industrial investment and job creation, and that site readiness will be a critical factor in our ability to compete successfully with other communities for the quality new jobs and significant tax base expansion associated with modern advanced manufacturing operations. The area under consideration for rezoning tonight is both suitable and attractive for light industrial development for many of the same reasons that it's not that well suited for residential development. It's proximate to US Highway 1, the Raleigh Executive Jet Port, and the active CSX rail line all features which offer valuable advantages to potential light industrial end users and job creators. In our communication with our partners uh, on the airport authority, they've expressed support for industrial use of the property on the west side of the jet port, um, such as the site here, as a compatible use and an effective buffer uh, from encroachment by other types of development, which might be less compatible with airport operations. For these reasons, as well as the proximity of water, sewer, and electricity infrastructure to the property, most of the area under consideration for rezoning tonight is already designated in the community's long-range land use plan as industrial center place type. In our conversations with the developers of the property, they've taken note of the success at CCEP and indicated they're committed to being good neighbors and that they envision creating a similar park to CCEP with attractive, well-buffered sites. We're excited about working with them to attract additional jobs and capital investment to San Lee County along the US-1 corridor. Thank you for your consideration tonight and for the opportunity to speak in support of this rezoning request. Thank you, sir. Ma'am, would you like one more time? And I'd like to limit the repeat the trips for the sake of time, so please speak freely as long as you like, and then we'll ask that anybody else that hasn't had a chance to come. Thank you. Sure. My name again is Audrey Ray. I live at 950 Breezewood Road. Um, this property is adjacent to the 616 acres. Um, upon receiving notification, I requested a copy of the zoning application. The, at best, this application is vague. It gives no clear idea of what will be built, but rather regurgitates the rezoning ordinances and the plan sampling map. The developer states that they are asking this property to be rezoned given its proximity to US-1, the CSX rail line, and the Raleigh Executive Jet Port. The subject property is more suited for light industrial development than the existing residential zoning. Residential development is often not compatible with either highway, railway, or air traffic due to the noises or other similar nuisances. I would like to point out um, Wake County as an example of why this is not necessarily the case. In Wake County, we see neighborhoods built along busy highways like 540, US 1, US 440, and US 40. We see residential neighborhoods built around Raleigh-Durham International Airport. Lastly, I would like to point out our own city, which has been traditionally built around the railroad. Um, in this packet, I was also surprised to learn that the zoning district being applied for has roughly six pages of potential uses. This is a broad list of potential uses, and it's alarming to me. There will be, will there be an ABC store, a hotel, a racetrack, a landfill, a shopping center, maybe a chemical plant or a septic treatment plant. Will the noises of these be loud? Will they be quiet? What will the light produce? light production be? What will the smells be from these unknown businesses? I don't think that it is unreasonable to have a clear understanding of what will be in my backyard and how it will impact my quality of life and my property value. 
doing my research, I also um, learned about the fire department as we discussed earlier. Additionally, I learned about the uh, technical review committee. To my best research, it seems like they have not started to apply for this um, and that they could do this while going through this process, but that doing the technical review committee would provide a site plan and ideas of what would be built in my backyard. Um, when we look at the setbacks, there is no height restriction on the buildings. Um, so how do I know that there's not going to be a 75 foot building in my backyard? Um, to my best knowledge, there's no trees or natural buffer that are going to be tall enough to prevent someone from looking into my house in the back um, in a building that tall. As a resident, I was required to provide a site plan when I applied for my zoning application to build my house. Um, I was also required to fill out an affidavit about my accessory building stating that we understood that our accessory building could only be used for certain uses without special permits. Why am I, as a resident, required to provide more information than a developer looking to develop 616 acres? The 616 acre development is not just any development, it is quite large. Something of this size and magnitude takes time and planning. And the best that I can see is the time of planning has occurred behind closed doors. We all know that closed doors meetings are done in quiet and that sometimes these um, situations can be pre-baked. After the last meeting, we spoke to the um, developer's representative and we asked for a neighborhood meeting. He was reluctant to meet with the neighbors um, because he didn't want one neighbor to be the lead voice in this. So why bother having a neighborhood meeting right if it's pre-baked? I also question um, why they feel so comfortable to apply for a general rezoning. Um, it's more suited for a conditional rezoning uh, where we could provide certain buffers to the residential properties um, as well as a few other assurances. Perhaps I am wrong, but it seems like we are writing a blank check to play with with this light industrial use on 616 acres. Um, if you're comfortable with writing a blank check to this developer, then I guess you can go for it. But as Mr. Post stated earlier, he likes to do his due diligence, and I just don't see where enough information has been provided to do adequate due diligence. I'm not requesting for this to be not developed. I would be naive to think that this would never be developed. I'm just asking for the council to help the residents that currently live there have some assurances with a conditional rezoning. Um, that's all I have for you tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate your comments. Are there questions? Just for staff? I have questions for staff um, regarding zoning. Uh, under this current classification of zoning, I know it would, would require a special use permit. So would a quarry be acceptable under this zoning classification? Are you asking me if it would be permitted in light industrial? Yes. All right, so let's flip to, because I don't know that off the top of my head, but it should be in the staff report. Let's flip to the list of permitted uses. I have to follow that. Can you give us that page? Page 41 of the packet, I think. Okay, and this is, it has it's on page 49. 49. Uh, again, as Councilman Taylor mentioned, it does require the issue of a special use permit. Right. And that, okay. So if it is rezoned to light industrial, then a special use permit request would go before the City of Sanford Board of Adjustment, and the four findings of that that are mandated by state law would have to be approved in order for a special use permit to be granted. So it is theoretically possible, but there is another step. Um, as it relates to the conditional zoning product that we have, would that not give us some say in regards to road infrastructure, i.e. Uh, Rod Sullivan Road, uh, we <coughs> probably cannot handle that traffic? Conditional zoning is always site plan specific. 
So yes, sir, you would have at least a conceptual site plan that you would be able to provide input on and perhaps suggest the conditions that the applicant would have to agree to. Thank you. <coughs> Anyone else in the public that had a chance to speak? Mayor, I will make, just want to make a couple of comments. One, people, uh, this is not a blank check. It's not even close to a blank check. Uh, traffic conditions are reviewed by North Carolina Department of Transportation. When a, once a developer gets involved, that triggers it. So you, they're going to decide what the developer must provide in the way of traffic if adjustments may be made as far as water runoff potential for floods the north carolina department of environmental quality reviews that there are many many steps that are involved before anybody can build anything uh, and we've had so many people come before the board and say i'm afraid somebody's going to cut the tree and clear cut this if you own if you own property you can go out and cut your trees anytime you want what triggers this is when a developer comes in and is going to develop it then the, when they, they are aware of it the op the eq become involved and have regulations and criteria which must be met so it's it's more restrictive when a developer comes in than if you own a property and you want to go out and cut your trees so uh, th this is not a free blank check that somebody can come in and do whatever they want. Thank you, Sam. Other comments? Uh, Mr. Mayor. Yes, sir. While it does appear to be a complicated and a free blank check, it does to me appear to take some, uh, put some liability on the city. Right? Uh, and then, you know, my opinion is this. I, I think that I believe what the developer is saying, and, and I don't think it's a great regional uh, deal there with the site of state and as well. But again, I think there's still some liability because it's a city without some conditions on it uh, as well. And I'm just going to state my case with that. And my, my question is to the council, and this is not to the council, is we know we have any kind of opportunity to have any kind of liability that's going to be taken to be turned upside down and does not go as, uh, as planned. Thank you, sir. Anybody else? All right, at this time, then I'll move to close the public hearing. Thank you. Our public hearing is closed. We appreciate the input and the feedback. We have several more to go, so we'll keep on moving if council's okay. All right, thank you. Let's get and go to item number uh, 8D which is also an application draft that provides criteria developed to rezone four tracts of land. Um, 